everyone, my name is Ornella Hernandez and I'm your host for Crypto TV. I'll be breaking down some of the latest news from the Web3 world, including saying happy birthday to Ethereum. And we look into a supposed rug pool. And as well, we have two special guests joining us on set today. So please stay tuned. Let's get started. One of the most famous cryptocurrencies in the world turned eight years old on July 30th, 2023. We're talking about Ether, the second largest cryptocurrency by market cap after Bitcoin in the market, better known as the Ethereum blockchain. Eight years of growth have already passed since the Ethereum Foundation first launched the network. Ethereum has given way to revolutionary applications and organizations with the concept of smart contracts that make it possible to trust that funds and personal data can be tracked at all times. It has also made possible the creation of non-fungible tokens or NFTs, most of which use Ethereum to be generated and then to purchase and sell artwork and digital collectibles. At first, Ethereum was worth 31 cents on the dollar when it first came out on the market, and today it trades around $1,900, just a little bit under right now. And it is the second most popular cryptocurrency after Bitcoin. As of today, the total number of transactions on Ethereum have averaged at more than 2 billion transactions. And there are more than 96 million digital wallets holding some fraction of ETH. Using ETH's birthday as an opportunity to reminisce, Binance CEO Cheng Peng Zhao posted a tweet on X recounting the time that Ethereum co-founder Vitalik Buterin stayed with him in Tokyo in the months leading up to Ethereum's launch. CZ said that Buterin was talking about ETH non-stop at the time, and he actually lamented not buying Ether at first. He says, if I had bought ETH then, maybe I wouldn't have had the need or drive to start Binance. Who knows? Joke CZ. Now, what I find most interesting about all this is that Ethereum has the same astrological sign as me. We're both Leos and my birthday's coming up in August, FYI. Something else happened on July 30th that's pretty interesting. Coinbase's new layer two network called BASE saw increased activity related to meme coins. Now, we're gonna talk about one particular token that was trending on this new chain, which Coinbase launched for developers in July. The token is called BALD and the entire cryptocurrency community on Twitter, now X, is talking about it. But not for good reasons. Firstly, the token is a possible reference to Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong's shaved head, aka his bald head. And secondly, Bald rose nearly 3,000% trading via the decentralized Leet Swap exchange, and it made up more than half of Leet Swap's daily trading volume that day. But then it plunged in value by almost 90%, the next day. This led to some conspiracy theories. Immediately, crypto Twitter thought that Bald was a rug pull, which is a type of scam where developers seek to attract investors and then abandon the project with the funds that it raised. People thought that the developer, named Bald Base Bald on Twitter, was pulling the liquidity. So he actually tweeted that he had been adding liquidity in smaller batches of ETH. But then conspiracists thought that the rug puller must be, for some reason, Sam Bankman-Fried, or SBF, FTX Exchange's former CEO, now currently under house arrest, and that he was secretly pulling the strings of the new meme coin balls on base. This guy thought that it was SBF because one of his reasons included Ball's developer using the same sentence structure in tweets and similar sounding posts on DYDX which made him conclude that it was SBF. But this is highly unlikely because SBF has very limited access to electronics and apparently he uses a flip phone, according to his friends. Turns out that the DEX lead swap was having some issues. It tweeted that some pool liquidity might have been compromised and we temporarily stopped the trading to investigate. While this reason isn't as exciting as the conspiracy behind SBF, it just goes to show how decentralized exchanges are perhaps the wildest thing to be found in the cryptocurrency world. DEXs are a common place for meme coin mania to take hold, and anyone can create a token. And with no strict parameters on which ones are traded, seems like a wild, wild west. Even Ball's developer ended up stating that he prefers to wait as long as it takes until there's a reputable DEX with at least somewhat low chance of exploit before adding back very modest amount of liquidity, he said. He also added that 
For those who still want to trade balls, you will probably lose all your money if you somehow haven't already. And that this is a meme coin. There is no roadmap. The fundamental value of this token is zero. There is no ball team. There is only a deployer and an immutable contract. Thanks for the reminder, Bald Baseball. He will also apparently be donating the profits to nonprofit organizations that have gone unnamed. In the month of July, hacks, scams, and rugs were up big. $300 million were lost to exploits, hacks, and scams in July, which is the most in a single month so far this year. The most concerning part for me of all this ball situation was that it was executed on Coinbase's brand new blockchain, Base. And since the US-based crypto exchange is in the middle of a legal war with the SEC, it is likely that the regulator will use this incident as ammo. I actually recently spoke to the head of BASE in Paris, France a few weeks ago in July. While I don't have a statement on this supposed rug pull, here's his more optimistic view on BASE. And so really we think about this almost as a um, next generation app platform, like the iOS app store or the Play Store. Um, the where, Coinbase app store? <laughs> <laughs> not the Coinbase app store. Um, I'd say it's the app store of Ethereum. It's mm. the app store of crypto. Um, and we're building tools uh, in an open, decentralized way that make it easier for developers to build those apps and users to use them. Now, please stay tuned for two special guests joining me on Crypto TV today, Alex and Prakash. Hey guys, joining me today, we have Alex, who's on the faculty of UCLA. And then we have Prakash, the CEO, Engine Starter. How are you guys? Fabulous, Good. thanks for having us. Yeah, I wanted to start off with an easier little question and ask, what was your first investment in crypto and when? Uh, my first investment in crypto was at the age of 16, 17 on Ethereum. Okay. Same. Yeah, I participated in the Ethereum uh, ICO back in the day. Um, you know, I wish I put in more, but it was a good experience and, you know, got to learn more about the space. So Ethereum was also my first investment <laughs> in 2017. My dad actually was the one who wanted me to buy it. Amazing. Yeah. And um, it's actually Ethereum's eighth birthday. Do you guys know that? That's this right. year? Yeah, this year. Yeah, yeah. It was in India. Right? That's right. That's yeah, right. It's so right pictures India. of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was on Sunday. Okay, and now next question. Mm, do you guys have any horror stories from investing in crypto? Could be any scams you were involved in or something that just went totally wrong that you can share with us. Uh, I would spend the rest of this <laughs> talking about the bad ones. But uh, I don't know. I think that for for the time that a lot of the ICOs were, were raising uh, incredible amount of money without being mildly regulated, you had a lot of rug pulls, mm. right? And then as a kind of a venture investor, you spray and pray. And then sometimes- You spray you, and pray? You never what heard you about say? that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you spray and pray, and then whatever doesn't come out out, out of your praise are horror stories. Mm. Okay, what about you? Well, coming from Singapore, you know, there are a lot of projects back in 2017, 2018, lots of horror stories. But in most cases, we invested, we never got our tokens back. Uh, only to realize, you know, the founders were trading, selling it, doing OTC trades, uh, and as early investors, we never got anything out of it. Oh, sorry about that. Well, it, we learn <laughs> and we move on. <laughs> okay. Now, I know you guys also do the crypto event circuits, and you're always going to different meetups and conferences. So I wanted to ask, what's been your favorite event so far? Or maybe your most memorable ones that you've been to or participated in? Uh, I would say that on my end was the World Economic Forum when they started onboarding crypto and the crypto community through the Global Blockchain Business Council. Um, yeah, that, that for me was a tipping point of high level institutional players adopting mm. crypto. Okay. And what about you, Professor? Uh, personally, I would say it was NFT Alley in 2022. Mm. Um, I think the vibe there was uh, great, the space, the way that it was organized. Um, and, you know, the oh, after parties. Uh, Actually, were, last year. Yeah, yeah, last yeah. year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that was like the best, you know, it's all in one place and, you know, it was very well organized and met a lot of good people, good vibes. So I would say NFT Alley. There's a lot of celebrities also that made right. appearances there on stage, That's I remember. That's right, yeah. 
I think mine would have to be South by Southwest, which was not too long after sure. NFTLA, just because it was my first time there and it combined everything, right? Mm -hmm. So from crypto to movies to music. So that was a good one for me. All right, now let's get into the meat of things. Prakash, I want to start with you because I know that you run a crypto launch pad. That's right. So if you could just break down what exactly that means, sure. what is a launch pad? Sure. So, um, you know, we run a, a platform called Engine Starter. Uh, we did our own uh, IDO in October 2021. Uh, since then, we've supported uh, over 80 projects. Okay. So IDO means initial uh, DEX, DEX offering. offering. Yeah. So we're primarily a crowdfunding platform, um, but um, our community buys and holds our tokens. The more that they hold, the higher locations that they get. Uh, and then we go out and seek early stage uh, investment opportunities, either in tokens or on NFTs. Uh, we put them on our platform, our community comes in, they purchase and they own those um, tokens. Uh, and that really goes back to the vision of what we had where we wanted to democratize the whole VC space mm. uh, and bring these opportunities to the retail market. Uh, and that's primarily what we've been doing over the past two years. Okay, let's talk about the VC space because I know, Alex, you also run your own, you're the managing director for uh, 7CC Blockchain Investments. Mm -hmm. So maybe we could go into how maybe you've adapted your investment strategies from the bull market to the bear market. So you can start with you, Alex. Uh, yeah, we've been in the space since 2017, primarily. Uh, we've done a lot of things. I usually quote one that was surprising to me back in 18. Uh, we went to buy um, a Bitcoin mining company in uh, North Siberia. Okay. <laughs> uh, that, that was, that was an, an impressive experience to get out there. Um, but I think that obviously making money on bull markets that you have, you know, you don't need to do anything right, right? It's kind of like <laughs> Ethereum and ICOs in 1617, you just place the money and collect yeah. the, the gains. Uh, I think the challenges in bull markets is basically managing your cash flow and building. In bear markets. In, in bear markets, I'm sorry. Uh, managing your cash flow and building or supporting projects that are in, in the long run building for the bull market. Okay. What about you? Yeah, so we, we launched in the bull market mm -hmm. um, and during that period, GameFi and gaming was really hot. Uh, and then along the way, you know, we kind of followed certain trends. Um, and I think, you know, in the uh, space that we operate in, you know, it trends very, very quickly. Uh, so we got into entertainment. We did a few projects in the metaverse. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say since the beginning of this year, it has been a big focus on AI. Uh, most of the projects that have done very okay. well on our platform are incorporating AI into, you know, a business model that they're building on. And that's really helped us. Uh, stay true during this uh, bear market, um, but it's still a lot of hype. We still need to work with a lot of these projects to make sure they implement, you know, they execute what they look, uh, you know, they're saying that they're doing, and that's primarily what we were focused on at this point of time. Okay, yeah, I wanted to ask which sectors or verticals you're looking at. So AI is one of them. Which other verticals would you say that you're looking at to invest in at the moment? Um, on our end, we try to look at things that are mainly getting a lot of traction, right? And those today are obviously global climate change impacting models because if we don't have a planet, it doesn't really matter how much money you have. Uh, we look a lot at AI and the, and the crossover between AI and DeFi. Okay, let's get into that sustainability concept because I know crypto for good is a big topic right now and Prakash I know also that engine starter has a lot sure. of sustainability initiatives maybe you can go into some of those sure so it all kind of started post FTX you know we did a lot of soul searching and you know we uh, in intensely spoke uh, within the team uh, and we felt that Web3 needed to have a real world utility mm -hmm. right so that's primary uh, the journey that we've taken over the last couple of months. Uh, we felt that the blockchain has a key role to play uh, in carbon credits, you know, kind of solving the double counting, um, you know, providing better data provenance. Uh, and that's kind of where we started going a lot more into the impact and sustainability space. Okay. Uh, we started doing a lot of round tables. We have done two uh, here in Dubai and we did one in Singapore. We're doing another one at the later part of August. Uh, and that's kind of where we kind of created this uh, think tank of sorts, where we brought industry practitioners, we brought people who are in the field 
doing all the good work, um, but not knowing, you know, the opportunities or the purpose of blockchain. Mm. Uh, and that's primarily how we're kind of building this out. Uh, we're looking at launching uh, a regulated launchpad later this year here in uh, Dubai that will be primarily focused on uh, impact and sustainability. Uh, we'll only be open to accredited investors. Okay. Uh, but this is where we want to, you know, go around the world, source for quality uh, projects that are really having a triple bottom line, right? Where they're doing good for the environment, they're also profitable, uh, and they look good doing it because it's going to help the planet. And why is blockchain a solution for these types of environmental issues? Uh, from an academic point of view, one of the biggest issues with carbon credits is provenance, right? And the ability of you not buying one that already has been sold. Mm. So if you utilize the technology of creating tokens that are immutable and single, you can track the provenance through on-chain, which is still a thing that everybody's working on. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you can talk a lot more about <laughs> it than I can, but I think that the technology in itself is a disruptor. And we're seeing this with the track file and the traditional legacy validators of carbon credits like uh, Vara and Gold Standard, which are, which are looking at that technology and are seeing their business being disrupted. Okay. And then did you want to add anything about... Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, one key thing that really got us excited is the, you know, the, the funding gap that exists uh, in climate finance. Uh, and we come from the Web3 space where, you know, during the bull market, you know, just uh, a few graphics of monkeys can raise <laughs> um, a whole lot of so money. Sold like pancakes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we felt that, you know, if the Web3 community can come and do what's good, you know, where we can bring the community together, we can educate people and we can all participate in a very crowdfunded way. We can actually do good both online and offline. Mm. Uh, and that's primarily what we're building for. Okay. And then I did want to talk a little bit about crypto hubs because I know that Engine, based, uh, Engine Starter is based in Singapore. Sure. And then Alex, you're based in the US, but also have a focus on LATAM. Mm -hmm. So maybe we could compare the crypto markets and the crypto communities in these places. Um, we can start with you. Sure. So I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate to, you know, being having been Singaporean and, you know, having seen how the, the, the crypto industry evolved. Um, but one key thing that is still a challenge back in Singapore is regulations. Mm. Right? And, and the reason why we're currently setting up here in Dubai is that they have been very forward looking uh, from a regulatory perspective. Uh, we ourselves have been going through that process where it's a very consultative uh, approach that we have. Uh, with the regulator, they sit with us, they understand what our business model is, how is it that we're operating, and they've been guiding us in terms of what potential regulations that we can get. Uh, I, for one, do believe that in order for us to thrive in this space, we definitely need to have regulations, uh, and that will bring a lot more trust uh, into the ecosystem, that will definitely bring in a lot more larger investors, uh, and that's the reason why we're going through this painful but important journey. Are you moving from Singapore or just having bases in both? Well, our operational HQ will continue to be in okay. Singapore, but I think, you know, um, definitely as we start to meet new talent and, you know, the, the hunger here to be in the Web3 and the digital asset space is very high. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think we'll definitely be doubling down. Uh, and one of the key things that we have learned in this region is that we need to localize content as much as we can. And that's primarily where we've been building. You know, we've been hiring community man managers. We've been hiring uh, brand and marketing uh, folks because we need to kind of localize things for the region. Uh, and it's not going to be a cookie cutter of what we've done in the past and try to bring this into this market. Okay, I see. And now going to the other side of the world, <laughs> in the Western world, we have the Americas. So Alex, maybe you could talk a little bit about what's going on there because I know in the US we have horrible regulation, uh, regulatory yeah. landscape right now. But then in Latin, for example, there's very high adoption of, of cryptocurrency. For sure, right? So if you if you draw a line like right at the edge of uh, San Diego, right? Mm -hmm. I think that that kind of separates both worlds in crypto or in, in Web3. Uh, you're seeing companies like in Mexico being, Bitso being like one of the uh, biggest wires of uh, money from Mexico to the US back and forth via crypto projects. Our focus is mainly in Brazil because of it being the largest economy. 
and being very friendly from a regulatory point of view. Uh, last year, both the, the, um, the, the president, the central bank and the Securities Exchange Commission came together to create the regulatory framework. Uh, and then Brazil is releasing its uh, CBDC at the at the beginning of next year. Right. So we're seeing a lot of the banks. I think that's a good thing, CBDCs. Uh, well, CBDCs <laughs> are good. Uh, yeah. Well, CBDCs in in from a tech from an academic point of view go against a lot of like the decentralization point of view. Right. Right. But I don't think you can live in a world where you don't have TradFi or an evolution of TradFi. Mm -hmm. Our thesis, both at the university and at the firm, was always that either TradFi adopts crypto or it's going to continually to be something that people like us that like frontier technologies are into, but it won't reach the masses. Yeah, and it seems to be heading that way, I think, yeah. with BlackRock and yeah. Tesco and all those big companies going in. For sure. Yeah. And then... I also did want to touch Prakash because I know that Palau is also become, uh, trying to become crypto. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so Palau is a small um, ocean state uh, in the Pacific. Um, you know, they have a small population of 20,000, mm -hmm. um, um, but they're really, really very motivated towards being a blockchain hub. Um, I, I think the first thing that they introduced was uh, known as a digital residency. Uh, which really got us very, what, very... What does that mean exactly, a digital uh, residency? Yeah, so basically what it allows is if you actually go through a, a process of KYCing and, you know, going through uh, a process of validation, you're actually given a digital residency. So very similar to what Estonia did uh, in the early days of the startup world. They're now um, attracting uh, digital nomads and also attracting people mm. who are excited to be in the blockchain space uh, and that's one key thing that you know we have seen um, you know I've met the president in the three visits that have been there and they're very very excited to actually uh, so we're doing an event in the later part of um, August uh, okay. it's called the Palau Blockchain Summit you know we've got friends from all around the world who are actually coming together uh, to kind of co-create right so everyone's bringing in their expertise their experience and we're looking at kind of how can those technologies now help a small ocean state, you know, kind of build this uh, big vision that they have for themselves. And wow. we're going to be building this together. It's such a tiny country, though. It is. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of random. Uh, I feel like. <laughs> yeah, so the land size is equivalent to Singapore, but okay. the, the ocean um, size that they have is about the size of France. Mm. And that kind of allows them to actually explore things like blue carbon credits, which they're really oh, excited okay. about. Okay. Um, and they've, in the past, um, you know, survived on tourism, which has generated revenue for the country, but also destroyed uh, the environment. But now they're moving towards ecotourism. You know, they're encouraging people to come, enjoy the nature, but also do good and, you know, plant some corals and do some good at the same time. Interesting. Did you know about the developments in Palau? Not about blockchain, but uh, Palau is certainly like a surf destination as well. It is, yeah. It is, yeah. All right, maybe one day I'll make it out there. You should. And yeah. then just, we're running out of time. So final thoughts, guys. I wanted to hear from you about um, maybe your prognosis for maybe the rest of the year in the market when it comes to investments. I think that we're going to see a major wave coming to Dubai of uh, startups, uh, entrepreneurs, investors. That's one of the things that uh, I'm focusing on here uh, because one, Dubai is a global center, like Singapore, like New York, like Miami, uh, but with a very friendly regulatory environment, right? And, uh, and also a very uh, strong and, and forward-thinking government that's looking to regulate things the right way. So we believe in our thesis that Dubai is going to become, if not the major, one of the the major crypto hubs for the next foreseeable future. Okay, what about you? I'll, I'll, I'll second that. I mean, we definitely see smart people and smart money moving into the space. Um, you know, it, it was the same thing that we saw in Singapore in 2017, but we're seeing that happen in a much um, bigger speed at this point of time. And, and in terms of size, 
Uh, so we definitely feel that you know Dubai is going to be that big hub, but I think it's more also looking into the region. Um, so we see Dubai as a launchpad into the mm. GCC region, um, but this is where we can learn and you know adapt uh, in a very comfortable way, uh, and eventually look at localized strategies that will actually take us to the rest of GCC. All right. Well, thank you guys so much, Alex Thanks. and Sakash, for your time today. That's a pleasure. Yeah, and everyone, a please stay tuned for the rest of Crypto TV. Now let's take a quick look at how the markets are doing. Today's crypto market report. Bitcoin's price stays steady around $29,000. The price of Litecoin has been going down and is at $83 today. Ethereum is also down this past week and is currently trading at $1,830. Solana is up slightly up today hovering around $23. And that's all for today, folks. Please remember to hit that like button and leave your thoughts in the comments below. Until next time.